Hello, thank you for joining us this Sabbath uh, on our lesson nine, I kind of named uh, Contrary Passages. My name is Sergio, I'm here with Don, and we'll, uh, Don, if you want us to open with prayer, and we'll get right into it. Absolutely. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord, to come together for this Sabbath school lesson. We ask for your presence to be here with us tonight as we discuss this lesson, Lord Jesus, and that you will help us, Heavenly Father, to convey to the audience what it is that you want them to hear. Be with us all in a mighty and special way, Lord Jesus. Guide us and direct us in all that we do. Amen. Amen. We have an interesting um, interesting lesson, right? Lesson number nine. Uh, very, at first, I mean, different people have different views on this. Um, I I can, uh, the memory text is in John 539. I'm going to go ahead and read it right quick. Okay. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these and these are they which testify of me. So it's kind of an interesting segue. Um, and it's kind of letting us know that we do have to search the scriptures. We do have to know our scriptures uh, so that we can testify of, of Jesus. The problem is, as humans, as we know, um, there are a lot of people and there are also a lot of opinions. And sometimes they are... Everybody has yes, one, too. Yes, they're not quite as subjective, <laughs> yeah. And the people are very eager to... And I like how, you know, Ellen White says here about Jesus. Um, Christ himself did not suppress one word of truth, but he spoke it always in love. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, and never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censor human weakness. And that made me think of when we get, when I get uh, to talk to someone, or if we get uh, to talk about a subject that we're passionate about, we sometimes can come across um, so much so enthusiastic that we can come, you know, we can kind of either not allow the other person to speak or, you know. So the first paragraph, which I had highlighted over here, kind of gives a little bit of clarity too on what you're saying, right? Yeah. Because it talks about what Peter said. He said, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason That's the for the hope that is in you. Yeah. But it's a defense, not an offense. And too many times, <laughs> too many times as human beings, we become so adamant in what we believe that we're overly forceful in delivering our opinion to other people. And that doesn't draw people to Christ. Yeah. That pushes people away. No, I like how it's, uh, I think it's somewhere where the Bible is a two-edged sword, right? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, people will use, or your mentality can really direct what you take out of the Bible. In other words, if you're looking for something to be to be justifying your opinion, then you're going to find it. And uh, on these, well, they're giving us, you know, through Sunday, to uh, Monday, to they kind of give us different yeah, uh, yeah. scenarios in which people can uh, either curtail the message to their liking or manipulate it. Well, it's like we were talking about, too, during our Midweek Connect session, right? And I brought up that gentleman named, um, I pronounce his last name wrong, Marty corrected me. Um, <laughs> His name was actually Fire Robin. I always called him Fire Brand because of the way it, it looked, the way it was spelled. Yeah. But anyway, he always made a statement which has stuck with me for years. And it's very true, especially when it comes to this lesson tonight. Because just like you said, people can always find support for their own arguments. Yes. Right? If we take the Bible and we look at chapter and verse in the Bible... And we only take out the text that we find relevant to us, we can substantiate this about anything. Yes. All right? But if we read the before and the after, typically that gives us a different viewpoint on yeah. things. And so what, what Mr. Fire Robin said many years ago was when you take a text out of context, it's a pretext. It's a right? pretext. I remember that, yeah. Right? That's true. That is and very that's, true. That's, yeah. that's very true when it comes to what we're looking at right now. But then at the same time, it says we do have to be ready. And, and, and when we do explain our viewpoint, we, we, we have to use some of these texts. But we, uh, like, I, like I was reading in Ellen White, is we have, we have to do that without being rude. Absolutely. Without being you know, condescending mm -hmm. or 
appalled. Hey, I mean, what do you mean like that? And I remember I, as a kid, I used to have arguments with my, my schoolmates. Uh, he, they were Orthodox, obviously, and we were, had arguments about where do I get from, from where do I understand that the, the Sabbath is the, the Saturday is the seventh day? Because over there, all our calendars are start with Monday, yeah. Sunday is the last day. And we would go through, and I would be like, sometimes I would get upset. I'm like, how many times do I have to, to explain to you? And is and I can see where the zeal is the zeal, the zeal can be a little bit too much. Yeah. And I can see where you can provoke other people at anger and debate. And in in our culture right now, uh, discourse right now is very you know either you either my way or highway, and it, it's everyone. Well, or everywhere. At the end of the day, it's not our job to beat people over the head with the Bible. Okay. Yes. All right. It's our job to relate to those individuals in a way that's meaningful to them and bring God's message to them that way. Yeah. Okay. Over time by doing that, then you can introduce them to whatever you believe in. But if you just come out the gate saying, yeah, this is the way it is. Yes. And if they know? give you an opinion, you're like, nah, you know, what you know is wrong. Yes. You know, you, this is how it's the right way and so that's forth. That's right. So the first one we had tonight, the first uh, contrary um, story comes with the rich man and Lazarus, mm -hmm. which is found in Luke sixteen nineteen through thirty one. What did you get from that? Um, I think, I mean, I think people have to understand that um, you can't take the Bible at like everything is literal and everything is what it says it is right away. You do have to look at context. You do have to understand where where why is this been presented right here? Why did Luke say this right here? And what, what does that mean? Because if you don't, then you get to, you know what I mean? You get to, uh, to the messages are in error. I mean, you can believe things that are not actually there. You have to look at the context. Well, there's also, you know, there's a lot of illustrative aspects to the Bible. And there's figurative Yeah, because like, the the, like Jesus spoke to them um, so they can, you know, like not philosophically. That he talked to them in examples. Sure. So they can relate to that. Yeah, but I mean, people take those examples and they consider them to be reality, and in a lot of cases they're not. They're just yeah. like you said; they're a parable. It's it's for us to be able to understand it better, not as a exact um, what's the word I want description. Yeah, 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 exact description of the, of the events that occurred. Yeah, I like I have highlighted here. It says right here in the kind of like the third paragraph down. Um, how could a mother be happy in heaven while beholding the insensate agonies of her beloved child in hell? In, su in, such, co in such a context, it would be virtually impossible for God's promise of no, no more sorrow, sorrow, sorrow yeah. crying, pain fulfilled. And I, and I, and I thought what I have here on the on the sideline, I was thinking. I think there's another one in the Bible where it says, I think it's Jesus saying to us, telling them, if you guys can give your kids good gifts. You know what do you what do you think I can give you, right? Yeah. And so I'm thinking I'm thinking of along the same lines. Like I don't think God's gift is this like this. I don't think God, God is this could not work if if taken at face value or literal. This could this is not the right way. Yeah. And George Ladd says that down here. This is this is a gentleman who wasn't even an Adventist, right? But he made the comment in his study that said that due to such incoherencies. Many, many modern biblical scholars regard the story of the rich man and Lazarus as a parable from which not every detail can be interpreted literally. Mm, yeah. So that first paragraph to me, or the second paragraph to me, says a lot. When it says that if we were to believe this as it was literally written, we would have to admit that heaven and hell are close enough to allow yeah. a conversation <laughs> yeah. between dwellers of both places. Yes, yes. Which is not we would case. also have to suppose that in the afterlife, while the body lies in the grave, there remains a conscious form of the spiritual soul with eyes, a finger, a tongue, that can even feel and thirst. I mean, we know through our study of the Bible that that's not, not even case, yeah. plausible. But then again, if they just read that one text, yeah. and yeah, you know, but that's just like, it. yeah, that's how we believe it. Yeah, it's you know, you die, you go to hell or, the, or to heaven right then and there. You know, that's why the Bible is very clear on it when it says, "Study to show thyself approved." Exactly. And I and I understand and it's and I like the way I think it's in Peter right where it says uh, you have to show reason for your hope. Right? Yes. And yes. that I kind of like that because you don't because the things you have to when whenever I say why do you believe like for example I had one coworker that had uh, passing in the family mm -hmm. and I was 
kind of telling her a little bit about the state of the dead and like when when somebody asks you why do you believe that it's not because oh I choose so or because I think because I think that's that's the right way to do you have to give them proof you have to show them why do you think why do you believe like this way it can't just be you know without substance the last part of this and I thought this was important said that the parable of the rich man in Lazarus presents a sharp contrast between a well-dressed rich man and a certain beggar named Lazarus. The account teaches us two things. One, status and social recognition in the present are not the criteria for a future reward. That's right. Yeah. And then two, the eternal destiny of each person is decided in this life and cannot be reversed in the afterlife. Yeah, you have to, your, your choice is here. Uh, they, that dictates have consequences yes. for the for the next yeah, absolutely yeah. um what else do we have there oh i did like that last part too where it where it said um um this is this is the, the question on the bottom yeah, yeah this, this is this is the um rich man speaking here and he says or no i'm sorry this is jesus speaking jesus. here and he says if they do not hear moses and the prophets Mm -hmm. Neither will they be persuaded through one, though one rise from the dead. Mm. So, yeah, because <laughs> if you can't, if you can't read God's and, word and, and accept it, yeah. and accept it, and then be taught by whoever, wherever you go to church, and and accept that, and understand and study for yourself, what what is it going to take for you to be, you know, understanding and accepting? Of what God is trying to tell you. Yeah, and I, yeah, I mean, like people like we had like one of my friends and when, we, when I was in high school, we would argue about, well, the Jesus' first miracle was he made he made wine. So why are you tell me I can't drink wine? And why and why do you have why do you have to go through this whole translation situation? You know, this God allowed, God allowed it to be this way. Then it's wine, and I can drink it, and I don't care what you say. Yeah, and again and again, it's one of those things where people choose to curtail what is written to them. Well, sure. Or about the, it's or about the, the, the not, let's not take into consideration the customs of the Jewish people, of what the good and the bad wine meant, and why, who, which wine was served first, and which wine was served later. Um, but you know, again, it's it's one of those things where you kind of, you know, pick your thing and go well, with sure. it. <laughs> it's what's more, it's... Yeah, what's more convenient, whether that's conveniency, whether that's. Um, you try and justify what you've uh, you heard it from your parents. No, it's, you know? it's it's exactly that. It's justification for the position that we wish to hold. Yeah. And when people dig in their heels like that, it's, it's, hard to... it's very difficult to move them from that point. And that's why I'm saying if you if you approach people like that simply with well the Bible says this, you're not going to win that person. Mm -mm. All right, you have to approach them through a relational aspect. And they have to see Christ working in you. Yeah. Then they, they present, start to ask yeah. the questions. <laughs> yeah. On Monday, uh, it's called "Today with Me in Paradise." That's another another passage, and, and it's basically the crucifixion, and the it's the thief that actually believes, and instead of seeing another uh, convict put to death, he actually recognized Jesus for who it really was, mm -hmm. which is you know the Son of God. <clears throat> that. Um, and and then basically the the, the uh, contra contradiction in there is is Jesus Jesus is telling me today you will be with me in heaven and yes. where the comma stays. Yeah. And again, and, and what does that actually mean? Yes. And how and people see people choose to forget that there were no verses in the Bible. There was no the punctuation is not like we have it in in English or another any other language. And uh, they choose to believe yeah it's today and then that's where it goes. But then they choose also not to where Jesus to take in consideration Jesus' comments to Mary either. Yeah. Uh, that hey, don't touch me because I haven't gone. Uh, I haven't gone back yet, to my father. My father yet. yet, yeah. And that gives a little uh, clue as to what, what you know what, how things how things are really how the things are truly are. You know what I mean? But I guess the question I have is, does it really matter? If if I mean if if you're dead and the very next thing you know and see, well, I mean they don't they don't matter in the context of your salvation, but they do matter in in your ideology or in your in your belief. Because if you choose, because if you believe you go straight to heaven or hell, well, that's not that's not what the reality. No, but ultimately, if the next thing you experience after death is second coming, second coming, then. 
does it really matter? matter? <laughs> because the next thing you're gonna re you're gonna realize is this is happening, right? That's true. That's what that that's what you're going to interpret, feel, see, whatever. That that's yeah. it. So to him, he was really going to heaven that day because the next thing he'll know will be correct. Yeah. You know, that's what it says, you know, in, in this last part over here. It says, so, so the most natural reading would be, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. In this case, the idiomatic expression, I tell you today, emphasizes the relevance and solemnity of the statement, you will be with me in paradise. In short, Jesus was promising him right then and there that you would be saved. Yeah, which, which makes sense. But some, I guess, some people want to believe that you go, you know, whether it's purgatory or well, whatever they call it. Or... You know, my, my wife and I talk about this a lot, Sergio, and it's like, it's a, it's a um, what do they call it? A, a, I don't know if that's the right expression, a social blanket, you know, where, where people feel comforted. Mm. Okay, that, okay, oh, my, cause... my mother's looking down on me, right? Or, or um, you know, whatever it is to, to make them feel more comfortable yeah. about the to situation. deal with the loss. And to or, deal yeah, with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And as we both know, that's, that's, that's not a correct interpretation, no. right? And again, I, I think it, it re relates back to what you said earlier. It's a justification, in some cases self-taught, in some cases taught by ministers, others, yeah. ministers, yeah, and whatever yeah. else. But it leads people to an improper belief yes. of what God is saying. Yeah. No, yeah, I definitely, I, I understand that. I like how on the bottom right here where it says, read the story of the repentant thief who despite his sin, despite the fact that he had nothing to offer God, was promised eternal life by Christ. How does this story powerfully reveal the great truth of salvation by faith? In what ways In what ways are we justified like that thief? In what would, in ways do we differ? And I like that because he, the, the thief didn't have time to, you know, do, to, to change everything, but he believed. So faith, nothing that you, nothing that he could do then, could have saved them other than believing in Christ. Yes. And I, I can't, I, I try to imagine what that would have been like. I can't. Yeah. Right. And I, I mean, it's not a war now. Don't get me wrong. It's not a license to be, you know, oh, I believe in Christ, but then I'm going to do whatever I feel like. No, no, but no. And nor, nor is it, nor is it the, the uh, other side of the coin where I can do everything I want in my life and still sin and whatever <laughs> yeah. else. And the last minute I can change. Yeah. Well, that's... <laughs> tomorrow we're not promised. Tomorrow's yeah. not, not promised for any of us. So, in that context, though, I can only think of it that here is this thief who's hanging on the cross by the self-described, or not self-described, by the, um, by Jesus, right? Who, who is the savior of the world, right? Mm -hmm. How he got that revelation that that was yeah, right, that he, yeah. actual. I see, I see what you're saying. Well, I mean, he must have been witness to the to all the maybe to what no, was happening. I think I think it was God. I think God, you know, or Jesus, the, at the time, worked on his... which is the same. But I'm just saying, somebody conveyed that message to him. Yeah, and said, "You're sitting beside your stand. You're hanging beside." All right, Jesus. Yes. This is real. This is the true being. This is the savior of the world. He's maybe like, yeah, his presence or the aura made him change. Yeah. The... Something something got through to him at that particular moment in time where nothing had gotten through to him prior to that. The... <laughs> yeah, like... And he had that moment, however that long that moment was, and he made the right to choice. turn yes. and said, please. Remember me. Remember me. And that's all it took. Yeah. Which is a lesson in and of itself, by the way, Sergio. That none of us have to worry about what's the word I want here none of us have to be you know thinking we have to be perfect or you know we're not ready yet I'm not worth, yeah. or I'm not worthy of this I just fail all the time I just it's can't just get it together it's an opportunity for us to turn to God and say come into my life mm. and also it makes me think of the of the general of the centurion when he said oh yeah, yeah just, you just say it you don't have to come to my house you just say it right? <laughs> just say it Say you say the name and it's done. That's yes, right. The measure of faith. I mean, that's the, kind of the same that's... same with the with the thief. Like, uh, yeah, I hope that I can have that faith and and uh, you know, put it in practice. The Tuesday is uh, lesson the, to depart and be with Christ. And it's basically talking about Paul, 
right? And it's basically saying that uh, Paul was driven with the passion to live with Christ now and with Christ after his second coming. Unfortunately, a lot of the people believe that those texts in Philippians uh, and in Thessalonians that he's he's talking about, hey, I want if like I want he, he wants to be with them now. Mm -hmm. So and I guess alluding to the fact that if Paul died, he'd be with, with Jesus right then and there. Yeah. Uh, but the things are it's, again. It's perspective. It's a matter of perspective. Um, it, it, it's it's about what we just talked about a yes. moment ago, and that is our ability to be assured in what God says. If He says we will be with Him, then we will be with Him. I yeah. mean, our our conscience is not going to be different. It's not like we can think about it in the grave and and wonder and wait and watch when it's going to occur. The next thing we're going to realize is that it has occurred. Yeah. Um, yeah, these things are kind of hard, bro, because like it says that Paul doesn't say anything about the uh, time lapses from the time that he's saying these words to when Jesus, uh, you know, returns. Uh, he's just saying that he, he's just eager to be with him. But then I also think of people like people that that die that, that were never, well, at least that we know of, weren't never uh, exp uh, exposed to the truth. And like, what do you think with what do you think happens with those people? You are talking about the people are not exposed to the truth. Yes, or like what do they? I mean, I, I, obviously this is you know a different question. I just think like for example, my grandpa um, passed before my uh, the the Adventism was uh, in the let's say in oh. the you know place where they lived or whatever. To me, is like how will the how will he be measured? I think of it. So I have to bring my father mm -hmm. into the context for a moment. My father told me many years ago when I was very young that in his mind it was about believing in God. It wasn't going to church. It wasn't, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it was having a belief structure in place, okay? I would always catch my father... You know, I'd walk into him, he'd be in his chair, he'd be reading his Bible. Yeah. So he had he, a personal relationship he, with He Luke. didn't necessarily have the lifestyle that I would like to have ha seen him have, but I know he had a relationship, and I know he read his Bible. Yeah. Now, up until, you know, unfortunately, I wasn't there when my dad passed, but I am hopeful of the fact that because he had that relationship, that God got through to him. In whichever measure, yeah. In whichever measure yeah, possible yeah. was before he left this earth. Yes. I got to believe it's the same way for everybody else that's out there. Just because somebody didn't come knocking on the door and give them Bible studies, yeah. that God has a way to get through to and people. And sometimes, so like this thief's uh, illustration yes. does help that, right? Because yeah. maybe maybe to maybe to my grandpa it was maybe a good deed or something, uh, something that he did that maybe it, obviously it's not the truth or it's not, but it's something that maybe his character was... He made a choice that was, I don't know. I hope so, you know. Well, I, I think we all have to ho have that hope. You yeah. Know? I, um, I tried for for, uh, you know, many years, you know, for my father. To have a deeper relationship, you know, he's, he was always that. He was brought up differently. That generation yes, yes. of people were very, very, you know, hard, very structured, yes. very, you know. You're not going to convince him he has to look himself and, you know, figure it out. And, and, so, and, yeah, I, and I definitely yeah. understand that. And so he, so he I believe, I got to believe that God gives us all the opportunity to know him and have yeah. a relationship with him. Whether that comes through you or I or another human being or it comes through God himself, I think everybody's given the opportunity. Yeah. yeah. I like how the bottom here says, uh, particularly in hard times, who doesn't, th uh, who hasn't thought about how nice it would be to be to close your eyes in death, and the next thing you know, be be with Christ. Yeah. How does this happen? Or how does this thought help us understand what Paul was saying to the Philippians? To the Philippians, and that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? I mean, who 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 doesn't think of whenever they are in a tough tough spot? You know that sure. This or, hate. or or like it says in the previous paragraph. Being able to rest from all your troubles exactly. without needing any needing any longer to suffer pain in your body, mm, mm, yes. you know. I, I, yeah, 
the, the, yeah, the way is to go to yeah, go to sleep and then wake up and be with Jesus. I mean, that's I have don't I have, have a worry about anything. I don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about death. I prefer not to yeah. personally, but you know, I like. Well, it's not, it's not in our control, and I can, yeah, I mean, I don't think about it either. It's not really in control. No, but I mean, you know, there there are, there are people out there that they dwell on that topic. But, you know, I, I prefer not to personally, but that being said, you know, my grandfather, when, when my grandfather passed, I always said, if, if when I go, I want to go like him. You yeah. Know, because he just sat back in his chair, just he asked asleep. for a glass of water, my grandmother came out to give him a he was gone. He just... Yeah. No pain, nothing. He just fell asleep. You know, yes. and that's the way I, I <laughs> prefer <laughs> yeah, it no. to happen. If it, you know when it, when it happens, but you know, I I just I, I just gotta believe that that God doesn't want us to suffer. You know, He doesn't want us to be in agony. He doesn't want us to be in pain. He doesn't want us to be. You know, yeah. I, I I see too much of that in, in this world and. I know that was never God's plan. Yeah, that's the result of sin. Yeah, that's the result of, of the fall. Yeah. On Wednesday, um, do, you, do you have anything else to add for Tuesday? No. I'm on busy. Wednesday, it's um, preaching to the spirit in prison. And another one. Yes. Yeah, another another <laughs> another one of those things where people can you know take a different route. Yeah, based on First Peter three nineteen, and it says that the. Um, Commentators here who believe the natural immortality of the soul usually point out that Christ preached to the spirits in prison while he was still <laughs> resting in the tomb. I'm not sure how you do that. But for them, his dis disincarnated spirit went into hell and preached to the yeah. disembodied spirits of the end of the Luvians. Yeah, right? Yet this fanciful notion is biblically unacceptable because there is no second opportunity for sal salvation for the dead. So why would Jesus preach to those who had no more chance of salvation? Yeah. Yeah, I, think, I mean, and again, the people refuse to, to not look at the context and don't understand that Peter was talking along the lines of faithfulness, of yes. being faithful. And it was definitely a commentary of, hey, li li literally, this is what happens when you die. Uh, he just used this phrasing to make it more clear. But if you, do, if you miss that, the, con the context, then... You know, you think that prison, not a prison of sin, but an actual prison. And, you know, he actually went and Jesus went and talked to them. I mean, that's... You know, I was listening to a sermon on the way over here this evening. And the one line the preacher said in there makes all the sense in the world. And it said that um, it's God's job to provide us grace. Yeah. It's our job to provide the faith. The faith, yeah. You know, and that's what we have to do. Yes, that is true. I mean, that's that's the thing. We have to do our part. I mean, people think that, you know, oh, you know, you just make a verbal statement and it's always done. No, you do have to reflect Jesus. You do have to have him and not the love of yourself first. But those oh. those things, you know. But people, people completely, I shouldn't say people, some people, I don't know if they, if they choose not to study the word. Or they choose just to study certain chapters and not the whole Bible. Yeah. But it's really hard to leave out Thessalonians, right? Where it talks about the state of the dead. Yes, it's really hard, yeah. There's another you know, thing you... And yeah. you hear, I'm you sure you... worries about anything. Well, yeah, but I, I hear, I hear, you know, first day pastors and preachers speak. And they all conveniently want to, to speak of the concept we discussed earlier where, you know... You die, you go to heaven. You die, your grandmother's heaven looking down. You know, all these different contexts that we know are not biblically accurate. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you just simply were to read the word, and especially Thessalonians, it's very clear as to what the state of the dead is. is. Yeah. But, again, it, it comes down to your ability and your desire to want to know what God's saying. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the deceiver has done a great job of, of mucking the waters and, and, and making, creating confusion. And yes, I mean, knowing, like, I guess the, the relevancy of this in your salvation may not be crucial, but I think, you know, as, as, as like we have to be ready to, and we have to know our, our Bible, right? We have to know our why we believe these things that we believe. Because otherwise, 
how do how do you witness to people, right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, did you have anything else to add on Wednesday? I'm looking through my notes here. I, I don't think so. Um, it, just this last this last paragraph here that says um, that we should notice in First Peter three, the spirits in prison of verse nineteen are identified in verse twenty as the disobedient antediluvians in the days of Noah. Yeah. The term spirit is used in this context and elsewhere in the New Testament in reference to living people who can hear mm -hmm. and accept the invitation of salvation. The expression in prison obviously refers not to a literal prison, but to the prison of sin mm -hmm. in which the unregenerate human nature is found. found. Yeah. And that's a powerful statement. Yes. Okay? Because... Just like we've been talking about many times this evening, if we're unwilling to study, if we're unwilling to, to have that relationship with Christ, and we're unwilling to gain the knowledge that Christ is freely giving to us, yeah. then we're demonstrating an unregenerate spirit. Yeah, and, and uh, another now that you say that, another uh, I've heard another other comments when they, well, you know, why would this Bible, you know, look at this Old Testament. All you see is a bunch of, a bunch of killing and people going through the sword and everything. Like, what, why, why is that necessary? Or, you know, how, why would I even believe in something like that, right? They're just, instead of looking at the context and understanding why those stories, and understanding that the, the multiple failures, it doesn't matter that Jews, it's just in general of humanity. That's why that's there for us to take from. Not to just sit there and think, well, you know, they did something so they were all slain or the earth ate them like you know made them disappear or something like where you know they had to put the even the child everything through the sword they don't under they don't look at the actual context and understanding why things are the way written the way they were written and they just choose to believe well you know all this goreness and all this like this i guess like why was the point in believing all this and again it's it's you know having that being deceived i guess and refusing to accept or I guess to make that choice of you know understanding or make the choice of doing the research and putting in the time but if you think about one ask so, so so even the chosen people right they were going to the promised land that to me was was very similar to how it would be for us going to heaven right God did not Long, want, strenuous walk. He did not want sin in the promised land. That's right. Nor did he want sin in heaven. In heaven, yeah. Right? So things like you were talking about, about the earth swallowing people up and all the things that happened to people that were killed, even amongst his own chosen people. It's because Or of why didn't he kill just because he took some treasure that he wasn't supposed to, right? Or something like that. I mean, many examples. Yeah, sure. But I mean ultimately it was about an unregenerate spirit, right? It was you don't want to follow what I want you to do, but see they don't look at it. They don't. They don't. They just choose to have one statement encompassing and just make their decision. Well, God didn't mean that. No, it does certain. No, <laughs> I know, mean it's okay if I do this, right? Yeah, he won't mind. It's just a little bit. Yeah, I mean, right? but you know, it's, it's it's. I like I like this lesson because it's it's uh, provoking us to be like okay. This, like you were saying, you have to present through your relationship or you have to show the love or Christ in your life before you go into the details and give them a lot of knowledge or try to tell them this is how it is. And I really like that because people have their own preconceived or conceived ideas of what, what Bible is and religion. I mean, right now, especially in our, in our 21st century with the brightness of, you know, uh, what do you call it? Um, um, uh, where we came from, the monkeys, and so what is the theory? I can come to my mind, but I mean, all these uh, isms and everything. Uh, we people have so 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 much distortion of they don't believe in God or you know evolution, you evolution. Versus, yeah, versus, I mean, yeah. you think of it, all of them, all of them, and they just when they hear about the Bible, they just think, oh, you're just, uh, and it's unfortunate, right? I mean, there all these notions, all these knowledge, so-called knowledge, it's so. Uh, prevalent that you, people can miss the boat like they can miss the message and well, that's that's the tragedy and, and we and, have to show it to them through our life i think and to sidetrack for a moment um what i spoke about in my in the sermon i preached on this past sabbath 
we can't have a complaining spirit, right? If all we do is complain all day, what are we really focusing on? <laughs> yeah. In, right? On yourself, on, on what you're not happy with or what's not you complying know, with your ideas. Yeah, we're yeah. certainly not focusing on God. Mm -hmm. We're certainly not furthering our relationship with Him. And we're certainly not believing His Word. Yeah. Right? So just like the Israelites did, you know, they could find nothing through their experience. And that's why, you know, you went through what should have been 30 or 40 days and ended up being 40 years. years yeah, yeah. Right? Because they simply just did not want to do what God wanted them to do. And that's just a stubborn, hard-hearted way of and we're, dealing we're, with we're in the same position, just a different Absolutely. covenant, but the, Absolutely. Same, the same thing. Absolutely. So Thursday, the souls under the altar. Yeah, this is basically talking about the Revelation in 6, 9, 11, right? Yes. And they're saying how the... Um, the apocalyptic yeah. seals. And... And which basically it's another confusion of the altar. Which altar was it talking about? Uh, yes. You know, how can people that are in heaven be looking for vain vengeance? Right? It doesn't it doesn't compute? Um, but people, I guess, choose to believe that. I mean, or choose to have discord. Um. <laughs> I like I, I like this this verse or this um, paragraph where it said the souls under the altar are symbolic. By taking them literally, one would have to conclude that the martyrs are not fully happy in heaven, <laughs> for they are still crying out for vengeance. This hardly sounds as if they are enjoying the reward of salvation. <laughs> the desire for vengeance can make your life miserable, miserable but your death as well. Right? Yeah, and I mean... If everybody who's a Christian today all has the same aspiration of wanting to get to heaven, why would any of this in Thursday <laughs> yeah. have any, any kind of credence to it at all? I mean, I don't even get how you can have that belief. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, it's just one of those things, like, I think it's like mentality. If you're, the way you're reading the Bible, it's kind of the way you're going to believe. Because if you have, or if you... Not if you're not praying and let God speak to you when you read, well, I mean, you're just gonna find what you're looking for. And if you're looking, hey, you know, I'm gonna, yeah, this dude told me something today, I'm gonna go show him, you know, I'm gonna show it to him. And of course, you're gonna find what you, what you're looking for. In this last paragraph, too, it also says that it's important to remember that John was not given a view of heaven as it actually is. There are no white, red, black, or pale horses there with <laughs> warlike riders. Jesus does not appear there in the form of a lamb with a bleeding knife wound. The four beasts do not represent actual winged creatures of animal characteristics as noted. Likewise, there are no souls lying at the base of an altar in heaven. The whole scene was a pictorial and symbolic representation. Mm -hmm. You know, but we want to think it's all literal. And that's not. It's a lot of times, like you said earlier, it's parables. It's allowing us to further understand. Not yeah, take not it. Not take it for, yeah. You know? But people, I mean, like, and again, people come with these crazy, like, for example, this is off topic somewhat, but yeah, like, uh, I've heard on the podcast somewhere, people are saying, well, you know, Moses traveled when he saw God in the burning bush. It wasn't really God. It's just that the burning bush was some kind of ayahuasca or some kind of uh, drug altering uh, that basically the smoke or whatever altered his mind. I mean, like, this is the kind of things that they, these people come up with. And again, it's because they're speaking from their own muckled perspective, right? Like instead of actually, hey, no, this is what happened. God, he, Moses did see God, where he talked to, to Jesus in, in the in the bush. No, but they they because of their either upbringing or their perspective, that's what they choose to to think, right? It's I mean, I don't understand how anybody would do that, but some people believe that way. So this last question is worth discussing for a moment. It says, who, especially of those who have been victims of injustice, hasn't cried out for justice, which has not come yet? Why must we, by faith, trust that ultimately the justice so lacking in this world will nevertheless come? What comfort can you draw from this wonderful promise? Yeah, I mean... Is it our place? I mean, just, you know, 
granted, we, we, we have that desire in our hearts when we have been victims of injustice to seek justice. I understand that. Yeah, I, pre- I mean, no, our place is not to... But is it our place? Or is it just our place to turn it over to God? Doesn't he say that vengeance is mine? Yes. He doesn't say vengeance is yours. <laughs> yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. He says vengeance is mine. So we have to release this and give it to him. Place it at his feet. And ask him to see us through. Because ultimately, if we if we labor on this kind of stuff in life, it eats you, us up. Yeah, you missed the point. Yeah, you missed the point for sure. I always like on Friday. I always like to read those uh, quotes from Ellen White. Yes, um, those are very good. You want to read the first? I'll read the second. Sure. So under Friday, the first one is um, based on the story of the rich man and Lazarus, and it says in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, Christ shows that in this life men decide their eternal destiny. Mm-hmm. Very true mm-hmm. statement. Mm-hmm. During probationary time, the grace of God is offered to every soul, but if men waste their opportunities in self pleasing they cut themselves off from everlasting life no after probation will be granted them by their own choice they have fixed in an impassable gulf between them and their god yes maybe that's what that story was really pointing to yeah yeah right and that self-described impassable gulf yeah and i like how it says that you 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 can't cut yourself off. It's not saved, you're, and you're always saved, no matter what. Do you can't cut yourself off yes. by the choices that you make? Yes. Um, and then the second one is um, when those early Christians were exiled to mountains and deserts, when left in dungeons to die with hunger, cold, and tor- and torture, when martyrdom martyrdom seemed the only way out of the dis- their distress, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer for Christ, who was crucified for them their worthy example will be a comfort and encouragement to the people of god who will be brought into the time of of a trouble such as never was and it's very important because we are you know we do we at least think that we are kind of towards the the way the world is going right now you you one can definitely see this happening or coming and it is important that we have this example of hey you know whenever if times do come hard guess what we are we, we we are to know that we are, we already have the example already set that was before us. And that last sentence is very powerful. Their worthy example will be a comfort and encouragement to the people of God who will be brought into the time of trouble such as never was. Mm-hmm. That's the thing, because because what, what happens if the if the circumstances change somewhat and you having a hard time at jo- uh, your work now because of certain things of you, that you believe in. You know, um, and I mean, we were told that those times will come, right? And we'll see, I mean, we'll see what kind of choices are made then. Did you uh, want to read any of these questions at the bottom? or? I just think what we should close with question number three. Right. Um, and this is just something for everybody to think about this week. You know, if you have questions about the lesson, or if you have questions about what we're about to read here, Certainly, raise them to us. You, yes. you can you can uh, place them on our, our, our Facebook page, I believe, or, or directly comments to the, below. Yeah, you know, or directly to the church here if you want. But this question was: Dwell more on the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. When Jesus had been raised from the dead, many believed on him. Yet many, having the same evidence, didn't believe. What does this teach us about how hardened human hearts can? be to the truth what can we do to protect ourselves from a similar kind of mm, hardness that's a very good question and that's true for all of us and we have to be able to get to the point in our own spiritual walk where we have to continue to minimize self because the more we rely on self in this life the further we get from right. God. That's right. So think on that. Yes, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and pray uh, and close us out. Uh, yep. Very good very good question and for each of us to, to, to think and meditate. Dear Jesus, thank you today for, for bringing us together and studying your word. Thank you for the message that you've given us. That you've given us. Um, help us to understand the entire Bible 
and help us to understand that the Bible does not, your word does not contradict itself, yet it offers messages for us to take and to apply in our lives and be ready for you for when you come to get us home, Jesus. And everything we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all very thank much. You. We hope that you have a um, good evening, good morning, whenever it is you're, you're watching this, and we look forward to hearing from you.